Creatives with AI Podcast, the spiritual home of creatives curious about AI and its role in their future. Jacker, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I ran across you, I think, on LinkedIn because you'd won a film competition, and we want to get to that in a minute, but Kat, how, did, how did you get to the point where you were actually creating an AI film in a contest? Well, last year during the Hollywood writer's strike, I started educating myself about AI. I didn't know a lot about it, but it was a hot topic during the strike negotiations. So I peeked my head in. I started seeing what the tools were really capable of. Um, and it really expanded my mind pretty quickly. And I started thinking very differently about my career and uh, the things I wanted to create as a as a writer, producer, storyteller. So I realized then that I don't think we really succeed when we resist a new technology. And I do believe that's what this is. So I chose to embrace it. And a few months ago, I uh, I went to NAB show in Vegas. And there was a after party hosted by Curious Refuge, uh, which is a wonderful educational resource for learning AI filmmaking. And they had a generative AI esports tournament as part of this party. And I competed and I won, which was um, very fun and totally unexpected. And that became a stepping stone to this uh, 48 hour generative AI filmmaking competition I got invited to be a part of, um, which was part of AI on the Lot. Um, hosted by AI, AI LA, um, which is just a, a, a wide group of creatives, um, you know, entertainers and people in tech here in LA. Um, and competing in that competition was very fun. It was also a crash course in the tools that I was starting to learn. Um, and I had to speed up, uh, speed up that process uh, in order to keep up in the competition. So it was a blast. And the film we uh, created was called Love at First Bite. Um, and my collaborators were Nem Perez and Adriana Vecchioli, um, incredible filmmakers uh, who I'm grateful to be great friends with now. Excellent. And just I'll say this now so that nobody tries to write anything down, but we'll put all the links to all this stuff in the show notes later. So if anybody wants to come and find it, just just come find the show notes and I'll have links to all this stuff. So obviously to the film and everything else. Um, so what tools were you using to actually create there's so many questions and I did watch some other videos and some other interviews and stuff. And I know you've talked a little bit about like esports and, and how, how you ended up winning that competition, which, which might be interesting to go into. Um, but what, what were the tools you were using to create the videos at the time? We used uh, mid journey image, number image generation. Um, and we upscaled those, those selections in a tool called Magnific which will really give you a fine detail. Um, it'll just refine the photo that you upload and you can, uh, there's, there's a lot of settings you can play with. Uh, there's, a, there's now a relight feature, um, which basically relight means you can totally change the set and, and the feel and the look and the tone of the picture while retaining the subject in the image. Um, but that tool really gave us like a much more of a crisp image to work with so that when we upload that, to Runway uh, Gen 2, or we could now use Luma, which didn't exist. Uh, Luma is Dream Machine. Um, uh, when you upload an image that's been much more upscaled and there's a much greater yeah. detail, then when yeah. you bring when you when you introduce motion, it doesn't have that sort of smoothed over glossy look that a lot of the AI content has, it can retain a bit more detail. Um, so it helps with that, okay. prevents that smoothing yeah, yeah. over process that happens. Um, that's how we created our B-roll footage of right. of the of the world. Um, but we also shot our film. Uh, we, we I was an actor, the other, um, Adriana was an actor in the film. So we, it, it felt very traditional, it felt like making a short film on the beach with your friends, which is what we did. And we took that that raw footage and ran it through a style transfer in um, tools called Kyber and Lensgo, which really just created a different um, different aesthetic, um, really this kind of like pop art look that we ended up selecting that aligned visually with the B-roll that we had created. So we shot our film and I think that that stood out um, and and yeah, kind of made it a love note to cinema, in my opinion. 
it's pretty cool. I mean, I did, I've watched it. And um, I also, <laughs> I was laughing as well because I saw you on IMDb and you're credited as a torso, which I thought was pretty funny. I didn't see that. Oh my God. Have you not seen it? I didn't it? see that. No. <laughs> it's great. Um, it just says, it, it's it, it's it's love it's love bites love at first and it's bite, like yeah. just says yeah sorry love at first bite and it says torso <laughs> that's i didn't see that but that's yeah we that's the the nickname we gave the character because and the other characters actually was it was named legs because legs. they had legs yeah. yeah um yeah 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 and that was the this odd couple pairing of these these lesbian zombies that we created um cuz we we turned right. it into a love story um that's hilarious that's then that's how we referred to the character torso and legs yeah that's too funny so that's what's in i so you're now forever torso wow. in IMDb, um which i think is 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 too funny hang on one second let me just open this window because for once i'm boiling hot in um, the uk which is <laughs> sorry about that we have a casual show here great <laughs> I could take my my uh, sweatshirt off. That might help, but um, that's really cool. And there are so many tools out there to use at the minute, um, and they're getting better and better every day. I mean, how long ago was that 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 you actually did the work to make the film? That was two months ago. Yeah, almost exactly. So right. in that eight okay. weeks, the tech has advanced rapidly yeah, already. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it's crazy. There's, there's some of the, I'm in a ton of different WhatsApp groups that are all related to AI and in different flavors. And um, one of them, a bunch of guys have got into the video stuff that's been coming out. And some of it's, some of it's quite freaky, mm -hmm. um, particularly the way it does like animals moving and the way it morphs. And, and when people move, it tends to like morph them into different shapes and stuff. But it's like it, it's almost like you'll start off with a cat and then you'll end up with like a fox in the middle and then it goes back to a cat and it's, 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 it's got its own aesthetic. And I think some of it is actually really, really cool. And, um, I'm quite curious to kind of see where it goes as a medium in itself, right? Because it's, it's now becoming its own medium. It's not the same as photography and it's not the same as film and it's not the same as video yeah. it is its own separate thing right I agree I, I I think so I think that it is its own separate thing um and it is cinematic it is storytelling so those aspects of it are similar to film but I do think it's interesting there is a bit of defensiveness around the word film itself um and but but I fully embrace AI creation storytelling as its own separate thing. I, I hope that we have our own platform and our own um, place to to upload this content because it's totally understandable if people don't want to see this on Instagram or Twitter or any of the other main social media platforms. Um, I think that we would be happy to have our own space. It's it's funny that you mentioned that because something that I've been working on in the background is a is an AI art awards um, for exactly that reason to give people who are artists and and we were we've been thinking we haven't been thinking video we've been thinking more like photography and kind of your traditional kind of art and and the idea was is that people could submit their AI generated art mm -hmm. and in different categories and then we would have some traditional artists judging that mm -hmm. picking a short list the short list of each category would then be printed to on museum quality paper and, mm -hmm. and gallery quality paper and actually hung in a gallery for public viewing because i think something that happens a lot of times with that stuff is no like people create tons and tons of stuff and they they a it never gets recognized and b it never actually makes it into the real world in any meaningful way and so I, I, my idea is to give artists an outlet where they don't have to enter AI art in a normal art competition. They can have their own competition and it can sort of be its own thing. So it's fun, you know, it's kind of funny that you mentioned that. And I hadn't thought about maybe we should add film to it mm -hmm. and have a film category and, or, or a video category and let people submit videos as well. Although that doesn't, We'd have to figure out. Anyway, sorry. Well, I know a little tangent. I, I know plenty if, of people, myself included, who would who would love to submit to that. Um, who would love that? Yeah, the, yeah. In the film 
film sense. Um, well, and it's interesting. I mean, we've had, I think I'm, we may, I may have mentioned this before, but I had Dan, Daniel Bedingfield on, who's a musician, mm -hmm. you know, he was a judge on, um, um, it wasn't the voice. Um, I'll look it up. Um, it's like the voice, New Zealand. Um, it's not the voice. What's the other one? Like the mask singer. No, no, is that? <laughs> this is really embarrassing. Now I can't think of it off the top of my head. I'm going to have to Google it while we're talking just because it's driving me crazy. Um, but I think that disclaimer that you're talking about, you know, creating a sort of separate category where it says, yes, this is AI and that we're being fully transparent, that that's yeah. what it is and that's what we use to create it. And I think that distinction is important and to honor and respect artists that don't use it, um, but also carve out a niche uh, for those of us that are. Exactly. It's X Factor. Mm -hmm. Ah, X Factor. <laughs> X Factor. Thank you. You saved me while I was um, <laughs> yeah. looking it up. Yeah, X Factor. Anyway, he he's, you know, million selling artist, you know, said loads of songs and, and he uses it very effectively. He uses AI for inspiration and to help him come up with new ideas for songs. Mm. I know other artists that are more traditional that have, you know, have fine art degrees and you know have been musicians but they also do actual art like they can they can take anything that they do in ai and actually do it themselves physically in paint if they want to right either just, improve the either yeah. use the basis of the image as like okay this is the goal and recreate yeah. it or tweak that image itself this reminds me um i did find a, a tool and a platform uh last week called exactly ai which is yeah. uh yeah this is that um the platform where you can upload your own style and your own artwork, but you can keep a privately trained model um, that only you use, or you use it to generate images for clients, and then you can touch them up, make them better, or you can sell the model um, and monetize it. And I'm really craving the writing version of this tool. I would really love to upload all of the content that I've written and see what it thinks, uh, you know, some what are some ideas, uh, you know, like idea generation based on my style and my uh, writing preferences and kind of see what it spits out, which would be really interesting because I'm a bit um, submersive, subversive and satirical with my writing. So I would be interested to see if it yeah, could even yeah. detect that or if it would take it too seriously. I'm sure it probably would. And um, just so you know, I had Tanya on my podcast last week. Oh, my gosh. I'm, I can't <laughs> wait to hear it. Um, that's wonderful. So, yeah, you should go and listen to it because... I, I saw it and, you know, kind of thought exactly the same thing. That sounds amazing. And the ability for an artist to take their body of work and create a private, mm -hmm. a privately mm -hmm. trained model that can then help them. And, and I was really curious more about it from like, there's a lot of artists who maybe they either get injured or they get old and they can't, mm. you know, they can't physically do the like fine Celine movements Dion. that they need to do anymore. That reminds me of Celine Dion. Celine Dion. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is one. Um, oh. I think Shania Twain had a, had a lot of trouble with her voice as well. Mm. So, you know, there could be something there, but, but I was thinking more like, you know, if you, if you develop MS or you develop something like that, that's a physical thing for someone who did, you know, so sort of some sort of art like watercolor or paint or oil painting or mm. line drawing or whatever, where they can't, they just don't have the physical shaking, hand, you know, they, hand. they can't yeah. do it anymore, but they still want to be creative and they, they're still creative people. You know, you could just upload a load of their art and then you could have them, you know, that they, they can learn how to do the prompting to get what they want. Mm -hmm. And it's, it then becomes more of a curation, mm -hmm. right? You become a curator of yeah. all the stuff that you have. Which that word seems to feel controversial to some people. And I've, I've seen this argument that, you know, curation is not creation. <laughs> These bold statements like that. Um, but even in that 48 hour film competition that I did, I became very aware that there's so many micro decisions that you have to make about taste, especially when you're filtering through, you know, you have 20 generations of an attempt of the same movement and you have to f not only choose the, not, not only the best one that has the least amount of morphing or hallucinations, but also the one that really aligns with your vision the most. So that, that taste, um, and, and you know, when it comes to creating an aesthetic that, you know, retains throughout an entire piece. Like you, you have to be able, you, you do need storytelling skills. You do need to be able to curate, um, and have good taste. So I think that that is a skill. Um, 
and it 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 matters a bit more than people are giving it credit for. Well, it's just it's just good editing. It's good editing. I mean, isn't it? At the end of the day, it's just editing. And I, for I mean, one, as a writer, I love editing my work. It's that it, you know that first draft is the hardest thing. But when I when I after I have that, it's like, oh great, yeah, I know how to fix it. I know how to tweak and adjust it and really you know amplify the the story the narrative storytelling in it. So yeah, I love editing. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably the only one. I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I actually, I did chat with a friend about that. She was like, what are you talking about? She's like, I love yeah. brain dumping. She's like, I hate having to review my work. I'm like, oh, that's the part I yeah. like. Um, yeah, exactly. But the the, the the advancement of the tools and, and them getting better actually reminds me of, um, I listened to a panel uh, last week uh, with the founder of Wonder Dynamics, um, which was acquired by Autodesk re- recently, but he was describing how um with you know a lot of these video tools do still have that morphing effect and it doesn't you know understand animal anatomy or um human anatomy but sora which is not you know publicly available yet um that model was actually trained with they trained it on physics first so they trained the tool with this like understanding of of physics and science before they trained it um, with with the knowledge of, of filmmaking or um, shot right. composition, and I think that's really smart. Um, and probably yeah. that's that that's that way of training a model. You know, you're speaking that the computer's language. You're you're speaking the language model's language <laughs> before trying yeah. to introduce something creative. And I think that that is really intelligent. Mm. And I would look forward to um, using Sora when it is available. Yeah, same. That's. But again, there's there's so many cool things coming. Um, I'll ask you about Neo Cinema in a minute. I don't know if you know what that is, but um, I saw a post that that was about that as well. So I'm curious. Um, all right, let's get into the meat of this. So you live in Hollywood. You know, you're right in the epicenter of probably all the discussions about this. Like when you go to parties or when you you know when you go out and you see people, whatever. I'm sure it's a topic of discussion. Like, what's the, what's your analysis of the general feeling? It may not be how you feel, but how do you, how would you interpret how everybody around is feeling, it, you know, in your circles? Well, I've noticed that a lot of these AI-centered events that I go to, um, I am one of the only either writers or person with a, like, traditional entertainment background. Um, most of the people I encounter uh, have worked in tech, gaming, um, extended reality, um, but also many, many VFX artists and graphic designers, um, right. artists who have used CGI, and they have their finger on the pulse because I think as VFX artists and some of them that I spoke to have said, you know, this happens every couple of years. There's a new thing and I have to learn it if I want to keep my job. So yeah. That that's been a really interesting conversation to have. And then among writers and directors, you know, who have spent their time, you know, in writers' rooms or creating short films or making their own features, um, there is a pretty strong sensitivity and rejection of AI. Um, and I'm encouraging my my friends uh, who feel that way to to come with me to these events and to just learn a, a bit more about it. Um, but it's yeah, it's pretty divisive at the time. Is the worry that they feel that they'll be completely replaced or that their work will be devalued somehow both what's the yeah. what's the core of the is it is it literally just they won't need us anymore or is it something else yeah my my observation is that there's an opinion of like this is this is a push towards like total replacement of creatives um which i don't think will happen again because of that curation aspect that we've that we chatted about um and you know ethical concerns too you know the training of the models like what you know whose whose art was used to train these generative ai models which is a very important question to ask and i think something that will over time um get smoothed out regulated um and you know for example suno and udio which are the audio platforms that are getting currently being sued by universal music group sony and warner um, because they train the models on, you know, this vague publicly available music. Um, but I think that that's happening because, 
Universal, Sony, and Warner want their own version of these models. So I, I think that those platforms will be acquired or shut down and those music groups will develop their own, uh, again, for private use. Um, for them to use, yeah. you know, example, you know, take a, take an artist's, all of an artist's discography and upload it and say like, you know, let's, let's test out what could be the next hit for this artist, you know, using their, their signature sound, um, yeah. which is a, you know, I think an advanced version of producing. Um, so I, I think that, yeah, that, that, that ethical concern is, is big and, um, it's definitely an important conversation to keep having. Mm. But I also think that the, backlash from the writers and directors from the creatives in Hollywood it's a very it's a kind of exhaustion that is coming after years and years of frustration of feeling this industry you know contract which it did after you know during and after covid you know we didn't bounce back after the pandemic there are these historic losses across the industry you know you open deadline of variety and you see you know bob iger said that Disney lost four billion dollars on their streaming platform. You know what? Yeah. It, like, what, and you zoom out, and it's like, well, what does that mean for me as a creative, or even these other huge pieces of IP? Like, um, Netflix had a Horizon Zero Dawn series in production, which is you know based on a very successful gaming Video franchise. Game. Yeah, and yeah. Um, it was in the middle of production, and you know, I, I don't know what the budget that had been spent so far, but probably upwards of tens of millions and they just shut it down uh there was a coyote versus acme uh movie that was right. completely finished yeah. you know it cost 70 million dollars okay. that's looney tunes ip wow. you, you think that that yeah, kind yeah. of ip is bulletproof yeah. right like as a creative yeah. i understand okay my 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 totally original weird period piece drama that might be a hard sell but you would think as a writer or director it's like well if i'm working on looney tunes ip then i'm safe then my my work is gonna get valued and shown and screen and they're they're not they they took a tax loss for that film same thing with batgirl which is dc wow. um and you know hbo max has removed um entire animated series from their platforms and the creators yeah. don't have access to the content that they created so even when you've gotten to the point where you're writing a film or you've worked on one even by the time you've wrapped and you're done and it's and it's tied up with a bow it can still never be released and and taken as a tax yeah. loss instead of that so i think that that's yeah. That's what we're dealing with on the inside. So I think that this response is an exhaustion mm. and a frustration and an anger towards like, this isn't working. What are we doing? But for me, those all of those reasons, the, the reasons for, you know, it, seeing this IP getting thrown in the trash, even when you're working on something that's tied to a big franchise, you know, there's such a big chance that it'll never be seen. That's a mm. reason to embrace AI and tr try to move yeah, yeah. move at least in a direction where it's like, well, can I start to develop my own portfolio as a filmmaker? Because that's the other thing is like, I don't yeah. have, you know, a lot of this work in Hollywood is convincing people to give you money to then develop a portfolio that you use to get more work. But so many of us are at the point where it's like, I can't even, I don't have anything to quote show for it yet. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. I want to develop a portfolio where it's like, hey, this is my style. This is my, this is my look. Um, mm. you know, I've, I've created these teaser trailers, these, these pitches that, that, that use this, this, these tools that can at least show you, Hey, this is like, yeah. this is my pre-visualization. This is, this is what I want to create. Um, or it's gotta be super helpful for yeah. that though. Yeah. That's right. Like, like you have access to tools to do that, that, you know, two years ago, even you, you didn't have access to do that. You know, you can create a sizzle reel on your own, like quite easily with way higher, perceived production value then then maybe you could even do yourself do you know what i mean in, in a much much shorter time period which i guess could be a nightmare for the studios because they're just going to get inundated with all sorts of content but from a creator perspective i can see how that could be much more exciting because it it enables you to do something that you couldn't do before and you can get that visualization across and you can say this is what i have in mind and if you can you know if if and you'll know this just from, you know, trying to create the film, like you have to get super creative in the way that you create prompts and how you, you know, maybe play systems off of one another and you give one prompt to one system and the same prompt to a different one. And then you ask them to improve it. And, you know, you can, you can kind of play them off each other and, you know, it, it, it 
to get something that you really, really like is actually quite difficult. And there is a skill in that. And um, I think a, a way to put your own original stamp on it, and this is mm. something that I'm going to choose to do, which is I think there will be legalities that come down to like, well, what was the prompt that was used here? And I think that there is language that you can use. You can say something yeah. like in this, you know, when you're prompting, you can say in the style of George Lucas, in the style yeah. of Steven Spielberg. I don't believe in doing that because that is a bit, that's a bit lazy. And you can achieve, mm. you can have a vision of like, okay, I'm, I am thinking, you know, I'm, I'm feeling inspired by this shot from E.T. or whatever, but you can get creative in how you describe that shot and achieve it with yeah. language that doesn't deliberately pull from the reference of a specific director or filmmaker. And I think that's important. Yeah. And I think that that's just, yeah. that that's something that I will stick to with prompting because there's a way to get creative without using that as a crutch. Yes, I agree. And I, th I also agree that I, th I think where we'll end up is that the prompting will become the IP, mm -hmm. not the result. Mm -hmm. So it, it's how do you get the result out of a system that actually becomes the IP. I, I know an artist who has a very particular style and he has a very particular way that he uses AI to get that style. And it's very repeatable and very successful. And it's a very complicated process that he's worked out how to do it. But it, it now gives him the results that he wants that are, that are commercially viable quite often. Mm. And you know, I, I've said to him, you know, hey, come on the podcast or come and, you know, t t talk to us about it. And he's like, it's fine, but I won't talk about how mm. I do it because I don't want anybody else to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, so I think, I, I agree. I think, you know, the IP is going to be in the, in the prompting. Um, yeah. Or, and for, for, for filmmakers who do create these teaser trailers or something, you know, it's, you know, it's many years ago when, you know, studios started optioning Twitter threads or TikTok video, you know, like we're, we're living in a oh, world geez. where, yeah, yeah. you know, TikTok series are being, video series are being optioned. Twitter threads are being optioned. Threads on X, oh, if we want to call it that. And so yeah, if yeah, that's yeah. the game, then we yeah. as creators need to be like, okay, well, here's my teaser trailer. Can I get enough people on these platforms interested enough sharing, liking, commenting on my content to show these studios, hey, this is a valuable idea. Yeah. And if they need that, if they need the public opinion yeah, to be yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah. look, this has 4 million views. If they need that in order to justify optioning a creator's work or Jeez. taking the you know the basis of the idea yeah, yeah, and then having yeah. an original creative team recreate that work without using AI, I think that's, a, that's the direction we're going in in the next three to five years. Interesting. I, as a non, as someone who doesn't, you know, come from that world and just, just somebody who watches films, um, and this is going back a little bit to something that you were saying about the fatigue and everything that you were talking about a minute ago. I, I can't help but think though, that the studios, not the writers, I don't think it's the writer's problem. It's the studio's problem because it's what they're funding, but as just a, as, as a, as a film goer, the last thing I want to see is the 14th version of a Marvel film and, you know, the 11th Star Wars film or the 15th Star Wars, like that, like I get it. It's a, you know, it's sort of a traditional sort of IP and a story that people have engaged with in the past. But I think what's happened is, is that a lot of people have become the viewers have become fatigued at only being able to go see another freaking Marvel film and another DC film. Mm -hmm. And it's like, we don't care. We want original content again. We want new films with new IP. Like I refuse to go and see the, you know, the 14th installment of, you know, saw 12 or whatever number it's on at the minute. Yeah. Like, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's, and I think it was you actually, and, and correct me if I'm wrong in our, in our pre-chat that we had the other day, didn't you say, that kind of the way it works is you can kind of go to a, you, you, you go to a company and you say, Hey, it's a little bit of this and a little bit of this. And you put them together and then you figure out that that's what's going to get funded. Right. When you're, was it you that yes, was saying yes. that? So when you're, yeah, when you're yeah, pitching yeah. a show or a movie, you know, something they want to hear, the creative executives want to hear is 
okay, well, what is it like? You know, like make, make a make a comparison. So you reference, you say, yeah. oh, it's 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 this show. You know, it's The Sopranos meets Breaking Bad or whatever. Like you actually reference existing material and say, this is what my show is. Um, and if we're already doing that in our pitches, then uh, yeah, I think that connects directly to using using AI to to sort of like demonstrate that visually. Yeah. Yeah. And I know there's some actors, I, I know the acting community is, is very broadly split on AI as well. Cause you've got actors like Tom Hanks mm -hmm. who said, yeah, totally fine. License my, license my image, use it for whatever you want. As long as you pay me for it yeah. and pay my estate for it, it's fine. Um, make all the, you know, do all the stuff you want to do with it. And then there are other people who. I can't think of one off the top of my head, but are like, absolutely not, not having any of it. I'm not doing it. You know, I mean, we know Scarlett Johansson and, yeah. and you know, <clears throat> her, her allegedly, her voice has, has been used in, in open AI, but I, I don't know what, again, in your sort of circle of who, you know, what, what would you say the sort of split is? Is it like 50, 50, is it 60, 40 or? I, I think it's hard to tell because people aren't being publicly vocal about it. Um, but I think this actually this this question actually relates to what you were saying about about Marvel franchises as well, which is this is commercialization. This is the business aspect, right? So I think Tom Hanks knows, oh, this is my path to a bigger paycheck. Um, and so yep. do, you know, if you, if you look at the fine print of some of these companies and the advisory boards, you know, um, Wonder Dynamics, which uses machine learning and CGI elements to, um, you know, reduce the cost of VFX and post, you know, you look at who's on their board, it's Steven Spielberg, Joe Russo. So you have these big players, these, these established veterans of filmmaking who are quietly either adopting or endorsing these tools. So I look to that as a as a signal to move in that direction um, because these are master, you know, all three of those names are pretty, those are commercially successful artists um, who understand the business. So I think that following, you know, noticing that and, and that moving in that direction is, is wise, but yeah, the commercialization of, of what you're saying with, you know, like the 14th Marvel film or the, you know, 10th installment um, that, comes from you know that's a business decision this is a for-profit industry and you want to you want to show your your investors your shareholders people giving you money hey we know this is going to work because it follows this formula from before and this is something that i think connects to a widespread problem that that everyone in the industry is trying to solve which is how do we use data to predict successful narratives and it's not, re it's sort of working, you know, it'll sort, it'll kind of work and then it won't. And it's, it's, it's this, it's, it's a combination of like science data and like, and like mysterious alchemy of like, what are people attracted to? And I think you're, you're, you're not alone in wanting original, different content. Um, but the people who are writing these checks don't want to make that bet because they don't want to lose. Um, but there's also but, there's but the losses but are happening anyway. The well. <laughs> but they poison. But they poison the well. Yeah. This is this is my point. Is that yeah. There is a limit to that, and and they keep poisoning the well, and so what happens is, is as a viewer you just get fatigued and you're just like oh god they're doing it again, and it's like oh god they're making another yeah you know, they're making another spin off oh god they're doing another and it's like just just make the show yeah and make a you know. TV, make a successful show, do it for three seasons or whatever it is, and then leave it and let people have enjoyed it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And then don't, don't come back for the, I mean, I can't imagine that law and order, if it's still running, that law and order still has the same, like, I'll be amazed if it's, if it's got the same numbers as it, as it had in the beginning, but maybe wow. it does. Um, it's, it was like 25 years that show was going on yeah. or something ridiculous. Well, you this know. is also, I mean, and it, the IP, you know, even beyond Marvel, beyond Saw, um, there's a, there's a tier of IP sort of below that, which is like, okay, well, it, was it a book? Has it been published? Or, yeah, and this is where even those Twitter threads and TikToks fall into this category of like, hey, what's optionable? And it's basically this obsession with IP where it's like we have yeah. to only produce things that have had like – that have a proven audience somewhere else. 
And yeah. I think that why me and other artists and creators call bullshit on that is because that doesn't translate. It it just it's not actually translating. And yes, maybe if the book series is big enough, you know, something like Hunger Games or um, even mm. Big Little Lies, which I do believe is based on a book. I hope that's true. Right. <laughs> I do. I think it is. Um, sure. You know, sure, there's there, there can, some of that audience will translate, right? You know, maybe something like 30% of the people who read the book are going to be like, ooh, I'm going to watch the series. But I, I guarantee you that most of the people who watch that series don't even know it was based on a book or and they don't care, yeah. right? They just yeah. – it's it's on – you know, it's the first thing that pops up when they open their streaming platform. So I think the IP yeah, thing yeah, is yeah. a bit bullshit because it doesn't it, – it, yeah, People aren't – they're not paying attention. Yeah. It's the same reason why a lot of, like, new creators uh, can't sell original shows, which they're like, oh, well, like, you haven't sold a show in the past, right? They're like, you didn't yeah. – you haven't produced or you haven't been a showrunner. <laughs> yeah. And that's that's another thing. You know, you want to you want to work your way up. You don't want to jump to being a showrunner too quickly. But the reason you can't is because they're like, well, we need a writer who – uh, is a name that we recognize here in the industry. Yeah. And it's like, sorry, yeah. but the person in Nebraska watching the show isn't going to recognize a single writer's name. Like maybe Shonda Rhimes. Maybe that's a name that they'll recognize, right? Because she's so prolific. But other than that, they're not going to be like, oh, well, this wasn't a senior writer with with six other TV shows, then I'm not going to watch it. Like the average viewer is not exactly. making these decisions. And it's just this, it's a bit of an echo chamber over here of people yeah. only wanting to give senior level people a chance and only only taking a chance on things that are very safe um and that creates a pipeline issue for people you know at my level or lower um, that prompted a question in my mind i don't know about in the u.s but i netflix certainly in the uk um one of the things i found just personally really interesting is the absolute it like takeoff in documentary like there's so many documentary films on Netflix and they seem to do so well and so many people watch it and nobody ever watched documentaries before. Like when I was younger, no one would ever watch a documentary. Like it just didn't happen. Mm. And now it seems to be one of the kind of flavors of the day. And m maybe it's just because, you know, that that's the, that's the bubble that I'm in because I tend to watch them and I see more, but mm. pe I just hear people talking about them and stuff like that. My point was, is that I think the online platforms like Netflix, and this this is, I'm going to reach back to something we talked about earlier, you talked about earlier, which is Disney losing money on the Disney platform. The reason Disney lost money on the Disney platform is because nobody wants to watch just Disney, right? When it was on Netflix, it did really well. And they went, oh, wow, people really like this. They want to watch online. No, we want to watch it all in one place. We don't want to pay Disney yeah. separately and we don't want to pay HBO separately and we don't want to pay Discovery separately. We want the one platform where it all is. Mm -hmm. And we'd, we'd actually pay probably a little bit more for that platform if it meant we had it all in one place. But I'm not going to pay a separate subscription to every single one. And this was the business model that they all missed. And they thought, oh, we can just make loads of money because we'll just put all our content and nobody can see it anywhere else. And everybody went, okay, see ya. Mm -hmm. Like the only people that subscribe to Disney that I know are people who have kids. kids yeah. And as soon as their kids get older, they cancel the subscription mm -hmm. because it's not, they're just not going to watch it. Yeah. And we also don't know where so, to find anything. It's, it's hard yeah. to, it's like, oh, where's the, the thing I like? And you don't necessarily associate a certain show with a certain brand. You, you just think of the characters. Yeah. So it, how do you, and you're like, exactly. where is it? What's that Western show that everybody started watching? Um, oh, um, Yellowstone. Yeah, Yellowstone. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I have no idea where to find Yellowstone. I can't find it over here at all. It's not on yeah, anything. I can't off the top of my head either. Ages. Yeah, it's on Paramount. Okay. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not going to sign up Paramount. just for a subscription to Paramount, Paramount just <laughs> to watch Yellowstone. Yeah. Right? And like, you know Paramount is for sale. I, I saw Paramount that. is yeah, for yeah, yeah. I mean you, you read that and you're yeah. like oh my gosh this you know this this household name is being sold for parts like what's happening to this company but I also saw on LinkedIn they're hiring for a VP of generative AI programming which yeah. pays a lot of money and I'm like what what are you doing I'm like you don't 
you don't exist. You should go for that. What are you doing? Like, yeah, maybe I could, I could apply. <laughs> but it's also like, what you, it's like, I, then that's where some of this anger comes from with the writers and directors again, where it's like, mm. you know, this big company wants to pay, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to a person to, you know, program AI content. It's like $300,000 would go very far with, with creatives, you know, my, at my level, you yeah. know, that you could staff a lot of rooms with that kind of money. Um, and they're just, you know, they're showing you like, Hey, yeah. we have the money, but we're not going to spend it on you. We're going to spend it over here. And that yeah. is definitely generating some bitterness that I totally understand. Um, mm. but by the time these tools are adopted as like, Hey, we're using these in the writer's room, we are using, um, Claude or, you know, these other tools. Yeah. I want to be in line and say, yep, I know how to use them. Here I am. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's, I, I mean, I think that's where it's going to go. Um, certainly I think, well, because I live in the world of uh, like, it's all I ever talk about. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so because I live in that bubble, I just assume that everybody uses it. And then I sort of, you know, sometimes I step out, I go to a family event or I go to some other sort of place or something. And then I start to talk about it a little bit and people are like, yeah, I don't, I don't know what you're talking yeah, about. Like, I don't use it. And I'm just like, how can you not? But, but then I totally feel like a tech pro, right? <laughs> like, Me too, yeah. I can't believe that nobody uses this. Yeah, thing and, but you know. it kind of goes back to what I was saying about this, you know, they only want to green light shows with, you know, senior level writers who maybe they're popular, they have Emmys here, but the average person doesn't know that. I think that's the same thing where there's there, there's a veil between what we're doing in the industry and what the viewers are noticing. And I think viewers, you know, across the country and the world there will be a point where they don't know that something was AI was was created with AI, yeah. and they don't really need to. It's not really going to affect their viewing yeah. experience, yeah. Um, That's right. and they're not going to clock it the way that we will here. So I, we have to remember, at least the people in my industry, it's like we're very much in a bubble. Uh, we're in a big bubble. These are conversations that are happening, you know, kind of behind the, I guess, the closed doors of of our yeah. of our groups. But then we talk about all that stuff that, you know, the random stuff that doesn't get funded. And then you look back a few years and you go, Westworld came out of nowhere, mm. right? Like it, some old film from the seventies that somebody decided, Hey, let's do something with that. Now I get it. They sort of, it, it was existing IP that somebody went back to, but they did something with it that was, that was completely different and new and was felt very modern and was actually more relevant than maybe they even knew yeah. um, at at the time. But that was amazing. It came out of nowhere. You know, Game of Thrones, that was a book series. Mm -hmm. And if you were slightly geeky and you read that kind of stuff, then you already knew about it. But I would venture to guess that for 98% of the people that eventually came on to the Game of Thrones thing, that was totally out of the blue. Like that was complete left field. It was so yeah. different than anything else that was on TV. And it, it was hugely successful. I feel, so, I mean, I feel the same way it about- It still can come out, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, and and I don't want to trash talk big IP too much because I think what I see in big IP that these producers don't is that like, okay, the IP is successful because the story is successful because there are and there yeah. is foundationally, there is a certain, you know, I hesitate- There's to, a good story. Well, I hesitate to use the word formula, but they're kind of art. Like, you know, Aristotle's poetics- you know, tragedy and comedy, it's still, it's relevant, you know, thousands and thousands of years later, like our myths, yeah. even our myths and legends across cultures, you know, religious texts, epic poems, like they're successful. And we remember because there is a, there's a hero's arc, right? And that's, yeah, I think that there's right. a mistake that, that, you know, the producers see like, oh, IP means it's good. It's like, well, the IP is good because there's an underlying story is really effective, but original work can do that too. It's just not yeah. going to come with the proven numbers that something like Game of Thrones has. Um, but I think, you know, as, as a non gamer, um, two of the most successful shows that I've watched recently, you know, The Last of Us and Fallout, incredible achievements, you know, cinematically powerful based on something, um, based on IP. Um, and I think that that is a really successful marriage of, you know, tech and gaming in Hollywood that um, really excites me. And I like, I, lo I love those shows and I enjoy watching yeah. them. And they, yeah, well, we can, we can, we could spend an hour talking <laughs> about those couple of shows yeah. as well. Uh, the whole gaming thing. One thing's interesting. When I very first started the podcast, like this was over a year ago, 
one of the first people I had on um, was a filmmaker and he was, he runs a program and what they do is they help people with ideas and new IP. But what he helps them do is, is to, I want to get it right. Basically to, to, to help them understand what's the ecosystem that they can build out of it. So when they come, they're like, it's not just a film yep. and this gets back to the book and everything else. Right. But it's the, what are the ancillary revenue streams that can go with that? So this is a, this is a film, but could it be a book? Could it be a video game? A comic. Could it be comic books? Mm -hmm. Could it be like, how do you, how do you build that out yeah. into a, like a universe? And, and then when you take it to a company, you say, I want to do this film and I've got plans and here's how we can turn it into a game and here's how we turn it into a podcast and here's how we turn it into a YouTube thing. Mm -hmm. And it's, and, and I think that's something that's relatively new is a is having to think about all of that. And then B I'm involved in a project personally where we sort of, somebody had the idea. For, it's not, the book wasn't even written yet, but they had the idea for the book. And then somebody who works in films said that would be a really good show. We should turn that into a, a show. Mm -hmm. And we started off with the idea of a podcast and, you know, we've expanded it. But now the idea is, is that we'll have probably a, the idea is we want to have a broadcast show mm -hmm. and then we'll have a YouTube channel that will show similar, like, like extra footage that doesn't make it to broadcast. So it'll be the kind of the same show, but it'll be different footage. And then we'll have a podcast that will have even more different footage in that. So you've got from a creator perspective, you're building a whole world where you've got, you've got a broadcast, you've got, you know, a YouTube channel where you can give extra content. You've then got the podcast, you've got a physical book that will come out later and you could even go around and you could tour this thing in different cities and you could do live shows mm -hmm. with the, with the people that are in it. Yes. And it's then when you take that as a package, right? You're now you're saying it's not just a film or it's not just a broadcast show that we want to do, or it's not just a Netflix, you know, documentary series of, of 10 episodes that we want to do. And then you go, and all of that's a franchise and it could be franchised and it can be repeated in every country around the world because every country has something that's a similar topic to this that could be its own mm -hmm. little encapsulated thing. And then people start to go, okay, yeah, there's yeah. some legs there. Yeah, right? no, and I'm, I'm smiling because as a, as a writer and creator, that excites me deeply and that is a new way of looking at creating content. Um, and is that something you've run across? Well, it's something that, yes, yeah, there's people I know who are developing either companies, organizations, you know, having a creative vision for like, hey, here's a complete and total picture of what it can become, which, you know, sorry, but like everything that you just described and some people I know that they're, what they're working on is like, that's just producing work. You're just doing producing work that these companies aren't gonna, willing to do for you anymore. And I think yeah, we're going to get yeah. to a point where it's like not only yeah. what you just said, but also you need an A-list actor attached and you need it to just be done already. And they'll just acquire yeah. it. Like that's <laughs> like, I think we're going in that direction too. Is like, oh, you have a- this, That'd be fine. This Yeah, this polished <laughs> product. You, you found the money, yeah. you produced it. And then you have a, a streaming platform or or- any platform, you know, be like, yep, we like yeah. it. And here's your, and then they give you, they, that that's your portal to having access to millions of eyeballs. Um, yeah. but everything that you just said, said is, is that that's creative IP franchise building. And, and, and even as a writer, I've tried to think of, I'm like, well, what is this job that I know I want to have that I don't know how to describe? And it's a cross between yeah. like narrative design and producing and curating, you know, it's, what are these were it's and to me that's where I get really creatively stimulated because I'm like ooh there's a there's a job that um we don't even have words for yet which means that it's from the future <laughs> yeah you're right and i i know they keep saying you know don't worry all the jobs you know people find other jobs and yeah they will to a certain extent i i do worry about the because I see a lot of, even in the intern roles and stuff like that, just aren't there anymore mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. they don't need to. Um, and, you know, people who are using AI to pick up the slack in, in some of the work that they do, you know, I, and I've been very vocal about this and very, very open about the fact that I use it on the podcast. You know, I, 
I, if I didn't have the AI tools that are available now, I couldn't do the podcast in the way that I do it. Um, I, I just don't have the time and, you know, or the money to pay someone to do it. Mm -hmm. Because huh, if anybody wants to sponsor the show, give me a mm -hmm. DM me. Um, but, you know, I don't have any sponsors or anything like that. I, I basically, you know, do all this off my own back because I enjoy it and I want to have the conversation. But uh, like I said, you know, I, I couldn't do it if it wasn't for that. And that was why I started the show in the beginning was because what I'm worried about is the steady long-term erosion of those junior roles. Because yeah. if you don't, Entry if you can't get the junior or, role, yeah. then you can't become a senior, right? Well, it might be. be and there just won't be the people. Yeah. I mean, it might be circumvented completely though. And this is why I think that, you know, seeing what this next generation, the people who are, you know, you know, between 16 and 25 years old right now, do they jump straight to, yeah, I am the director, I am the curator, I'm I'm doing, mm. I'm producing my own work. Like, is that, that when that is replaced, when those entry level positions are replaced, it is, yeah, I, I see what you're saying, but it's also an opportunity for those new creators to be like, great, I'm going to skip that step and I'm going to go mm. straight to curating my entire yeah. brand, which I think this younger yeah. generation just, they have an eye for it. They do, they see how that works. It's less of a stretch yeah. and they need less of a, you know, they, they don't need those six years as an assistant. That's a long yeah. time, you know, six to and 12 they've years. They've done it on, yeah, they've done it on social media. They've done it on social media. So it's like, you're, we're already at this point, like with a smartphone and with, you know, what you've done with this podcast, it's like, you're a complete, you're an in-house creator you know, and, and for filmmaking, it'll be like, you can, yeah, you go straight to being the auteur and the, yeah. and the director. And so I do, yeah, I worry about entry level jobs, but I think that the people who want those entry level jobs, at least the younger generation will just jump mm -hmm. to making and creating, um, yeah. and then gathering attention. And, and then that becomes, that's a platform for them to get, to get hired, to work on something even bigger than their own work. Yeah. Somebody said to me, and I don't remember it was again, it was it was quite a while ago and we were talking about it. And I said we were talking about the fact we were talking about robots, actually, we were saying, you know, robot maids and that kind of thing. And it's like only rich people would have them. And, you know, because they, you know, they could afford to, to the upkeep and all the other stuff. And they said, yeah, but eventually what's going to happen in a, like a cyberpunk future is that really where you're going to end up is that the super rich people are going to have humans do everything. Because mm. humans will be expensive, <laughs> it, and they already are more expensive. It, <laughs> but but it will but it will kind of come full circle, mm. right? Mm. So you'll you'll we'll get this pro proliferation of AI tools and robots and everything else will come along, and then it'll you know it will probably take loads of jobs and stuff. But the humans will never go away, and what will happen is is that the humans will then actually become the super premium mm -hmm. ones, and people will pay, you know amazing amounts of money and will that will become the really wanted thing again is that people will just want humans to do stuff and yeah okay fine you know i can i can have the ai i could do my grocery shopping like i don't care but you know the the things like the filmmaking and, mm -hmm. and music and art and all of that and pornography I, just to well, just yeah, put it that, out there yeah. like i think that human yeah, yeah. you know certified human made <laughs> You know, from everything <laughs> yeah. from, yeah, service jobs, yeah. films, Fair and enough. pornography yeah. is, that's going to be yeah. like, oh, yeah, like, let's, that is, it, it's it's higher value. This reminds me of a conversation I had with yeah. someone who <laughs> told me that cars, because, you know, there's so much tech in the cars yeah. that have been man manufactured in the last 10 years, you know, it's yeah. basically a recording device, you know, recording everything you do when you're driving, which is, yeah, useful if there's a, a crash, but also a little dystopian. And for the sake of privacy, these cars from like the late 90s and early 2000s when they're pre-tech, those cars are going up in value, yeah. especially yeah. Um, with, you know, wealthier people because they're like, I want something that I'm really off grid with, right? It's the equivalent of like, I'm tired of my smartphone. I want a flip phone. I want a flip phone again, right? Or I want to use a Polaroid camera. Um, so I do think that that nostalgic value and what you're saying about, you know, the actual the cost of human expense, which is impressive and challenging and films that come out where it's like, nope, this was all people and they actually traveled to the location exactly. and they shot everything. Yeah. It's like that is so that is a feat. And I, I have nothing but respect for that as a filmmaker and a writer. It's like it's nearly impossible to make a film. <laughs> like It's, you yeah. know, it's, it's yeah. a miracle when it comes together. So. I think that kind of celebration, and that's something I celebrate 
deeply. And even though I'm interested in AI, I will go to all of my friends' screenings and, and my peers when they create work that it's like, it was all people. I applaud that. And it's hard because ensuring that many people is expensive and hard. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, I I, I also think it's interesting that we've seen a, a resurgence of films using physical sets again um, for exactly that reason, because the physical set feels different, right? Like you can CGI everything to death and you can use, I know they've got the LED panel walls and whatever now that they use that, that looks slightly more realistic, but but there's nothing like having the physical set. And I think it was one of the the later Star Wars films that came out recently and they used a lot more physical sets again. And you could tell mm -hmm. it had that old mm -hmm. feeling to it. And mm -hmm. you could just, it was something that, that just translated onto, you know, onto the film and made it feel that way. And, and being some impressed of the stuff that, by it. Yeah. And, and like yeah. Mad, like I think of Fury Road, Mad Max Fury Road. Yeah. And knowing that like there was each of those vehicles that they made in those in those sequences they had to make five of every single one and they made those yeah. you know yeah and 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 when you watch yeah. that film and you're like oh my god this is real you know there's explosions and there's someone with a guitar like on a, standing <laughs> yeah, on a yeah. semi you're like this is crazy it's kind of like watching it's i mean it's stunt performing it's it's like why we go to the if you even if you think of like the the, the old circus, I guess, or watching someone like yeah. swallow a sword or like breathe fire. Like that's, it's like, oh my God, you could get really hurt and you're taking a massive risk. And there's something that we are so entertained by when we see that. Um, it reminds me of vaudeville theater where you, you you'd show up and you would peek yeah. through a window and be like, Ooh, like what's this thing doing? What's, what's this person, what's happening here? Um, and we're impressed yeah. by it and morbidly attracted to, to danger and risk and filmmaking is is that um so i agree i think that will continue to be celebrated yeah some of us even remember that stuff <laughs> <laughs> i'm not quite old enough to remember vaudeville mm. but um but i certainly do uh, i saw star wars when it came out in the cinema the first time mm -hmm. and that you know that was really the beginning of you know a lot of the the tech that we see now and the stuff that lucas did at the time was like incomprehensible to anybody who'd seen any films because literally everything we'd seen, oh you know, nearly up to that were, you know, they were real actors and, and real stuff. And we'd never seen anything like that before. Yeah. And, you know, it was, you know, we didn't, we didn't have any tech. There were no computers. There wasn't, none of that existed. Like we, you know, like when I was a little kid, like you didn't even use the phone and you know, the TV had three channels. And I know old people bang on about <laughs> this crap all the time, but but it it sort of makes your point, and and it's really nice for us to see some of the films being made in that way again, and some of it coming full circle finally. Mm -hmm. That it's like even the kids with all the whizzy tech have gone, oh my god, I just can't deal with this tech anymore, mm -hmm. and you know they kind of want to they want to take a step away. So it's good to see, and who knows what's going to happen. Um, I'm conscious of time. Thank you very much. We've we're sort of 58 minutes oh, in wow. already, <laughs> uh, which which that went super fast. Um, is there anything, anything else that, that you think we should talk about that we haven't talked about yet? Um, any burning issues you wanna you wanna raise? I would say this to my peers who feel hesitant or resistant about AI, which is you know this this claim that oh. AI isn't good for creatives. My response to that is neither are the actual human beings making these devastating choices about the content that we've created for, you know, back to what I said about Netflix, Looney Tunes, DC, the, it, these, these shows that have just been stripped off of streaming platforms without even notifying the creators. So AI, maybe it feels like it's not good for creatives, but Neither is the business as it stands right now. And this is an avenue to reshaping the industry that um, I think creatives can benefit from. Love it. Awesome. Where can we find you? I've, uh, like I said, I'll put everything in the show notes and I know you have a sub stack and you have loads of stuff. So tell everybody, where can they go and find all your stuff and where can they see your film? Yeah, um, uh, my sub stack is where I'm going to put 
you know, my my thoughts on AI and what I'm experiencing here on the ground in LA. Uh, so that's jaggerwaters.substack.com. Um, and also, yeah, Instagram, I use, uh, I use pretty often. I talk, I share resources. I talk about, um, you know, things happening in the AI news cycle. And my Instagram is glamorous reptile, uh, which does have a background story. I grew up in a house of reptiles. Uh, my father breeds and sells reptiles and, um, that's, right. a, that's for a different okay. podcast, but <laughs> that's the, yeah, we totally, I totally forgot about that because I did see your note when you sent it. It's a moniker. That's a glamorous reptile is, is it's really a moniker. It's a it's a yeah. it's a virtual it. presence, um, yeah, and it's yeah. the version of me that exists online. Um, so yeah, check out what I'm doing and um, love at first bite the film from AI on the Lot Cinema Synthetica's 48 hour film filmmaking competition. Um, it is on YouTube if you search uh, Cinema Synthetica. AI on the lot, <laughs> love at first bite. You will actually see a channel. There's a channel, um, and I'll, I'll I'll send you the link as well. Um, but there's a there's a a playlist of the videos because there were three yeah. there were three films in the competition, and we all used the same script. So you can watch all of them as well as ours um, to see how it was different um, in the process I described. That's great. That and that reminded me. I totally was we. I got sidetracked with something else, but I was going to ask you about the script. So. Um, but that's it. just quickly. So you all had the same script to work from, and then it was just about creating the visuals that went with the script. Because I was going to ask, what, like, where did the script come from? The script was written by Emmy Award winning creator Bernie Sue, uh, and he gave us a script that was very bare bones. It was really just like right. character one, character two, dialogue, no, no place setting, no, no action, um, right. and we imposed all of that. So. Uh, right. What my team did is, and I'm, what I'm glad we did is, uh, we went in a uh, comedy direction. And you know, when I read the script initially, I was kind of scanning it for joke opportunities. Like there's a there's a comment about um, there's a character that says, "Did you try the appetizers?" as a line. So that indicates, okay, maybe we're at some kind of party. Where are we? But I know, kind of comedically, with that beat, if you say appetizers and you cut to something that's not food that's going to be funny. So that, that, and yeah. that, that, uh, that I felt that pretty early on. And we shaped this little, uh, lesbian zombie rom-com, uh, with, it's got humor, it's got heart, it's got action. Um, there's gore, there's love. Uh, and I think underneath it is, is a very, um, relatable, uh, human experience, which, uh, was I ironic, I guess, considering the use of AI, but it also shows that, our humanity can still shine through when we use these tools. Brilliant. <laughs> and you're a torso. <laughs> and I'm a torso. <laughs> torso forever. Torso forever. <laughs> That's your new handle. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Jagger, oh. thank you very much for your time today. Thank that you. was really good. This was a wonderful chat. Cheers. Thank you so much All for right. having Speak me. Speak to you soon. Bye. Bye-bye. AI is a proud member of the AI Podcast Network. To stay up to date with current episodes and show information, subscribe to their newsletter at podcastnetwork.ai. And don't forget to follow the show on your favorite podcast platform so you'll always get the episodes as soon as they're available. Thanks again for listening and stay curious. 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 curious.